All right, everybody, welcome. We are live in New York City, and today is going to be an awesome product spotlight. Welcome. An integrated solution with a building systems approach. Please welcome today architect Michael Matthews on Dave Cooper Live with national experience in project due diligence, entitlement, design, finance, construction, and construction management. He has delivered over 5,000 units to the markets in Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco, Bay Area, the Southern California regions, Texas, New York, and Orlando metropolitan areas. Seeing a need in the market, Michael founded a new company called Assemblage Works, a multidisciplinary firm fully dedicated to the use of the modern methods of construction, including prefabrication, mass timber, and volumetric modular units. Through the use of the innovative design and delivery techniques, Assembly, Assemblage Works will execute highly sustainable products that provide value at the highest level for their clients, provide predictability and clarity to their construction partners and deliver products that are sustainable and livable for future generations. What does it take to bring this 360 degree approach together? How does the architect lead the owner and the general contractor to and through a successful systems built project? Well, we're going to get into all that today, but first we need to give a big shout out to our sponsors. So uh, thank you to Ben Hershey Forward Solutions Group for allowing us to deliver all of these examples of construction innovation. Forward Solutions Group is successfully driving companies to succeed where others have failed. If you want to find out more about Forward, reach out to Mr. Ben Hershey at ben at forwardsolutionsgroup.com. And another big shout out to Howick LTD. Howick has a long history in innovation and cold form steel manufacturing and produces innovative precision roll forming technology for customers throughout the U.S. and the world. Check out their machine's buyer guide for off-site modular construction, fast-built construction with light steel for framing. Go to their website at howickltd.com. All right, so without further ado, we got a lot to cover today. We got a great presentation for you, and we are live in New York City. So let's bring Michael on. Hey, what's happening, Michael? Hey, Dave, how you doing? It's great to see you again. And uh, yeah. thank you. Your introduction was amazing. I could have not done any better. And uh, I'm truly pleased to be on your show. You've done uh, an absolute amazing job in terms of promoting this industry and uh, and where you think we should be going. So I'm on honored to be here today. Well, it's it's an honor to have you here today. And I think when people start hearing a little bit about your background and how much experience you have in this industry uh, and, the, and the foresight you're putting into what you're doing at Assembl Assemblage Works uh, to bring our industry to the next level and how we're going to get to the next level is super exciting. But before we get into that, Michael, we want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospital or we may have a family member on and then they will spill the beans and we will embarrass you if that's even possible. But you only have two minutes to do it. The floor is yours. Go for it. OK, I'm going to see if I can roll through this. So uh, well, obviously, yes, born here in Los Angeles, been a native Angelino for almost 50 years. Uh, my parents moved to the north end of the San Fernando Valley early, early in my childhood. And at that time, uh, Rocketdyne was testing rocket engines about every other day for the Gemini and the Apollo missions. So as a kid dreaming of being an astronaut, it was one of the coolest places to live. Uh, uh, my father was also a surveyor, so I spent a lot of my childhood as his uh, rodman. So I was you know, running up and down mountains and various sites all over the, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, and also, I actually got my sort of exposure to architects. Uh, some of his uh, clients were very young architects, uh, you know, sort of, you know, names like, you know, Tom Main, Mike Rotundi, Frank Gehry, uh, who ended up all, you know, most of them became Pritzker Prize architects, uh, but they were very young at that time. And uh, uh, I had a chance while I was standing around holding a rod, talking to him to kind of learn architecture. Uh, what John F. Kennedy High School, this is some of the small things you want to know. Uh, played track and football. My only claim to fame in terms of my athletic worlds is I had my hand nearly removed by John Elway, uh, who was the quarterback for our arch nemesis high school. Uh, I had a technical drafting teacher also in high school tell me that I was never going to make an architecture school because I never took his drafting class. Uh, <laughs> well, being all kinds of stubborn, about two years later, I was accepted into the uh, USC School of Architecture Advanced Placement Program. Uh, where I was able to skip the, verse, uh, the first of five years of uh, architecture school and uh, never looked back since. Um, during the summers, I, I worked for a local architect that was one of the very first architect developers in Los Angeles. And so I spent my summers really, in essence, drawing during the day and working in the construction sites during the weekends. And 
that kind of sort of set that sort of set the seed for the rest of frankly for the rest of my career um moreover during my senior year i lived in rome as a part of the uh a scholar in residence program and studied urban design and construction techniques of the Renaissance and the Baroque architecture period. Uh, and I was also in Italy when Italy won, uh, in Rome when Italy won the World Cup. So that was insane uh, to be there. Uh, once I graduated, I was uh, one of the very, very first early firms I worked with is uh, Buff and Hen, which was the case study architects, a part of the John and Tenza book. And uh, they had won, oh, probably 20 or 30 AIA awards for design through their period of time of their existence. And they also, again, had a very unusual practice. They acted as an owner builder for all of their projects. So over the four years I was with them, I worked in the field in the morning and I drew in the afternoons. And over those four years, I probably helped them design, document and build nearly a dozen custom homes throughout California. Yeah. So it was something, you know, working with grizzly old uh, subs and really learning the idea from time reinforcement to actually putting things in. Right. It frankly altered my sort of worldview tremendously. Um, beyond that, I, I moved on and worked for very large corporate firms for the next 12 years or so on various projects throughout the United States and Japan. Sure. Um, I, uh, one of the very last offices I was working, I was actually finishing up the city walk project here in Los Angeles. And I was also working on city walk in Osaka and city walk in Orlando. Um, they were part of an entertainment studio that I will not mention. They broke away and they were going to yeah. create entertainment ven venues all across the United States. And they needed someone to, in essence, go and do due diligence in regards to the acquisition of these properties. And I had just started my own practice at that period of time. And so I spent the next year and a half literally flying the United States trying to learn about, you know, uh, due diligence, uh, acquisition of large scale properties across the United right, States. Right. And that really was the transfer point where I shifted from architecture into development. Uh, from there, I worked on uh, some of the largest uh, development groups across the United States. I worked for the Claret Group in New York. I worked for Four City on multiple projects across the United States. I was part of the uh, KB Urban executive team that did the Ritz-Carlton Tower at LA Live. So, the, and I then at sort of the end of this period of the last 20 years, I was also running a pre-construction uh, division for a major regional general contractor. Uh, where I was in essence trying to tie BIM and 3D modeling and utilizing my architectural experience to tie into the new workflows that a lot of these new sort of, you know, GC oriented right, right. Um, programs are trying to be integrated within this junk contractor. So you, um, have, you, have, you have no experience is what you're telling me. No, not really. <laughs> Uh, no. Or maybe I'm just schizophrenic. I'm really not sure. But uh, well, uh, about five years ago, I, I, I wanted to get out of the corporate development environment yeah. and actually start my own company. And uh, for the last five years, I've been working up and down the West Coast on multiple ground up projects and also okay. uh, value add projects where okay. and this is really where I ran in the modular. I was approached by a uh, small scale um, affordable developer. And he had, he wanted to do modular and I said, okay, well, look, I w I'll do your modular project, but I got to know everything and anything about this because, you know, if I'm going to do this and do this right, I just can't go in and completely uh, do this in kind of a um, sort of halfway, half-baked manner. So that really, in essence, right. started the kernel of the notion of what assemblage works is and what I wanted to do because... What I saw from the very initiation of working on these three uh, three different projects, uh, two up in the Bay Area and one down here, was that there was a highly fragmented, highly siloed basis. You know, the financing did not know what the insurance was. The insurance didn't know what the GC was. The architect didn't know what the manufacturer. And yet we somehow had to execute a project. And so um, this uh, really was the place of how I started. So, all right. There, there's a whole lot to unpack there. And we have a presentation. We're going to unpack a lot of this. And obviously, there, I mean, kind of like yeah, I, I feel like I'm looking at myself and hearing myself because there's so much passion in your voice for what you've done and where you've come from and, and what have you. But you said something before the show, right? You said most of my peers think I'm mad. Why would they say that? Um, it's interesting. I think, one, you know, why leave the development world? you know, you made a very, very good living uh, and step back into architecture of all things uh, after not practicing for probably, you know, the last 20 years. And in my mind, 
architects are frankly probably the most well positioned of any of this industry to drive the new what I would call what we're actually in our company is calling DFX, design for everything. Because it's not only for design for manufacturing assembly, but the integration of ESG requirements and sustainability requirements and the nature of the context of where we're going is that if we position and our proper communicators and as what we would describe as being perfect, what I would call mountaineer guides, that we are here to teach. We are here to ensure the fact that you're hooked to the rope. We're here to guide you up the mountain. Sometimes we guide from the front. Sometimes we guide from the back. But our job is to, in essence, project a basis of confidence and predictability to get these projects executed in a manner that fulfills business plans, the nature of the site, and the nature of what we want to do in our design intent. And, right. uh, and not only that, but it was just, you know, it, a lot of people are, I mean, I taught, uh, I was actually part of a uh, team that taught uh, a modular class at the University of Oregon last year. And we were teaching fourth year uh, students. And it was, it was really interesting because about a third of the class just fought it like crazy. You know, it's like, why are we doing this? This is nuts. This is not part of our industry. We're never, this is, you know, it's like, you know, this is voodoo. The other 40% kind of played with it like a cat with a mouse, but really never understood. But, but at the end kind of understood that there was some validity to where we're heading and what we we're trying to do. The other third though, fully got it. They fully understood that we weren't taking design intent away. We weren't taking their creativity away. We were giving them a whole new set of tools that, you know, really in essence put them in a place where they can truly stretch their wings and actually become even better architects because they had to think about construction. They had to think about all of these other things, supply chain, you know, and it was a, a really invigorating thing for myself because it really validated the nature of why we were doing this company because it was a transfer point of, a, of, a, of, of being able to bridge from a mentality where we sit right now to a new mentality that really I think will take us to a whole different place. Yeah, for sure. All right, everybody, if you are joining us, we are live on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter. So get your tweets on. And if you're not following Michael Matthews and you're not following Assemblage Works, you're wrong. You need to get out there and you need to follow him. But after the show, and if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel that is being viewed right now over 10,000 hours every 28 days, you need to go check it out. It's really starting to grow and become something that uh, I think the world can use to help us build it better. And we're really having a lot of fun showcasing the people on this show, such as Michael. Michael, let's hop into it. We have a, uh, a PowerPoint presentation that you want to share, and then we can unpack all of those things that you said and really hopefully have some great dialogue. I'll put yeah. your... Uh... Okay, floor is yours. Fan fantastic. All right. Uh, let's see. I've got to... Um... Bear with me a second. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is why it's live. So I'm going to, it's not. Yeah, hey, I always me, say uh, it's live. If it can go wrong, it's live. It will. Well, let's see. Um, let me escape out of this and then just, uh, uh, it's all cool. up. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just going to do it the old fashioned way. There we go. All right. Let's try this now. If not. Hey, just so um, everybody knows, it was working perfectly fine when we started yeah, the show. Absolutely. <laughs> so, um, normal. There we go. I'm just going to start here. Um, yep. So, in in kind of an essence, I'll, I'll just say that I, I, I'm going to forget the other slide, but basically state this: is that Assemblage Works is really three things. We are basically fully dedicated to the idea of design excellence in the urban environment. Uh, we, you know, first and foremost, we are architects, and first and foremost, we want to work in a, a world of true design excellence. Number two, though, is that we wish to be and will continue to always be 100% oriented toward the idea of utilizing DFMA and modern methods of construction as a methodology of what we do. Uh, I think we maybe will be the first firm actually maybe crazy enough to say it. And But at the same token, we feel if we're going to walk the walk, this is what we need to do, is that whether it is a mass timber project, whether it is a modular project, whether it is a project that has to be panelized, in our mind, this is the methodology that will get us faster and more predictable. And our job is to guide our owners and the rest of the team to find the right methodology 
with the right basis of fulfilling both time and budget to get us to the right place. Uh, the third issue is, is really the, uh, of our mission is really to, in essence, to be able to be the guide and the connector between owner, architect, and contractor, and all of the affiliate groups that basically are associated to this. And so uh, big picture, that is kind of what we're about. Um, this slide here, and, and like I said, I'm trying not to do a, a peer PowerPoint. This is actually a presentation I'll be doing in about a week uh, up north in Vancouver. But this, in a way, is the tipping point of modular. Uh, I use this slide not, one, it defines the nature of, uh, one, it defines the nature of our housing deficit, especially here on the West Coast. And you can see that right at the break at point of the Great Recession it was really where everything went completely awry and where we had lost probably 45 to 50 percent of our housing production. Um, and we have never reached it since. The other instance, though, the, the other and I think the thing that, frankly, is a tipping point is that at this time, uh, the a and &E, uh, the, the restructuring of the banking industry froze debt and equity for nearly almost three years. It gutted all of the skilled labor and the experienced project management in, in the A, the E, and the C sectors. And frankly, it's never recovered. And thirdly, it irreversibly changed the lending practice for developers for all, all asset classes across the United States. And thus you can see, and not only that, but I'll point a couple other things that happened. 2003 was the breaking point of where Revit was introduced in, in 2000. And its adoption was really never, except for very, very large firms in the United States in both the consulting basis and the E side and the A, the adoption was frankly, again, kind of the cat playing with the mouse till right about this time. And really what happened was, is that we lost, we were gutted of our entire senior staff. We had to find a way to be able to cross over and draw faster. I'll put those in quotations, uh, draw more effectively. And the only talent I had was all this new talent coming out of school because my entire upper echelon was gutted. And that's really where the breakover point, where the full adoption of BIM, whether it is Revit or whether it's Archicad, was really adopted right at that point where firms were reduced. We had to kind of restructure self. We had to rethink how we're going to operate. And that was the point we started to do it. And it is only at that time where we would start to re-looking at how architecture is related to the nature of how we model in 3D, and then how do we use this tool? Was one other thing that happened, and right around 2003, there's a book called uh, Refabricating Architecture that was basically written by uh, uh, Timber, uh, Tim, uh, Kieran Timberlake. And is one of the seminal books about the notion of architects, architecture, and prefabrication. It was something that I think I've worn that book out to the point where I think I finally had to get an ebook because I knew I couldn't wear it out there. But it really talked about the idea of product, of being architect as product, Archit architecture as process, and the nature of where we have to go in our industry, especially with the demands of. You know, it was at the early stages of sustainability, the early stages of data collection. And it was a seminal book of really being able to create that bridge of saying there is a better way. And but we got to have the right tools, i.e. the BIM and the data collection methodologies. We had to have the right mentality of process. And we had to have the understanding that architecture needs to so sooner or later bridge the notion of a project to project, a product, excuse me. So I use this slide a lot. More for anything else, it's just saying this is the place where everything happened. It is the place, yeah. you know. Yeah, so I got a question, you know, just looking obviously at the timeline, right? That was, you know, kind of during one of the, you know, great recessions, so to speak, uh, yeah. that was happening also at that same time. And uh, we, we have the NAHB uh, chief economist, Rob Dietz, coming on October 31st. Jen might have to check that and clarify, but I believe it's October 31st. And he says we're in another recession. What are your thoughts on, you know, what you learned from 07, 08 and how you and others should apply uh, those lessons now? 
Well, it's funny because as a developer, developers basically live and die with the idea of being able to play the recessions on both sides of, of the coin. Right. You know, the idea is that uh, I want to try to build as early as I can because I was going to be able to get the sub base and the contractors at their lowest bases I could possibly can. Everyone was hungry. I worked my way up to the tip. I basically then stopped. I started land banking. Uh, and basically shutting down my projects. And I went all the way to the bottom where I, in essence, start basically buying properties that were uh, either uh, foreclosed on or basically challenged. And, and I start to cycle all that. And every five to seven years, we played that game. The issue is, is that that game no longer exists. Um, the, the few things are happening out in regards to the development world. One is that um, before 2007, we used to be able to build projects with a, a, a massive leverage basis where I can basically build on a project where I have 10% equity into a project and I can leverage 90% of the rest of the debt to actually build the project. So it was extraordinarily, I wouldn't say easy because development is not easy by any means, but it was on a financial basis, it made things much more comfortable. And this is where it ties modular because the notion of dep early deposits, early uh, supply chains and everything else. Now we sit on, because of the banking rules have changed and the nature of the banks became much more conserved. We are now in a kind of thing where most projects require a 35% equity basis and a 65% debt, which means is that on a $100 million project, I am putting out the first 35 million. And that includes my A&E costs, puts all my soft costs, it puts all my deposits. And that's where a lot of, uh, and architects, uh, excuse me, developers are very, very squirrely beans. They do not like risk. They do not like challenges. They do not like unpredictability. And suddenly now I got put money out to a factory that I may or may not know. And in a way that I may or may not understand and have to buy insurance that I never have to have. So it, it is, again, this is the thing of what Assemblage Works is trying to do is to try to be that guide because okay. there are, it can be executed, it can be done, it can be run in a proper way, but that tipping point was really at a place where all the rules were changed mm -hmm. and all the basis of how we thought we developed and how we worked and how we put financing in place and how we did insurance. Uh, it was also at the time where there was a high degree of condos and it was a whole cottage industry in regards to uh, construction litigation. So that I use that point because in my mind, what I saw was that it was a true nascent tipping point where we have we, we've changed the entire paradigm and we had to find a better way um it used to be for example construction companies we used to have you know on any 50 to 100 million dollar project we would have a general superintendent three superintendents one would be for structure one would be for skin one would be for mep i have two project engineers and i would have at least one if not two pms fast forward now and I may have a general superintendent for three projects that's doing three different projects. I have two project managers that are running two separate projects. I got a project exec that's probably running five projects. I have maybe one PE and I have one or two superintendents that are spread across five different projects, which means that on the general contractor side, we're stretched enormously in regards to our means of being able to do quality, quality, quality control, quality assurance, ensuring the fact that the nature of the spec and design is actually being executed. And it's a whole different world in regards to what we're trying to do. So with, with assemblage work, you know, kind of walk me through the process of this educating the architects in a different way of thinking. I'll pull up uh, when you're ready for the next slide, I'll put them up for you. But um, I mean, th this is a big undertaking to really get architects, like you said, that are very stuck in their way. They have their own way of thinking and they think things are being taken from them to get them to, to rethink how they move forward. Gladly, I, I think I put it up on the screen if uh, you have it. Yeah, you perfect, see it? Okay. I do. So, you know, this is our ecosystem, our world that we live in, in regards to sort of a any project that we work in, especially on modular, because the things that didn't exist five years ago or even 10 years ago, I mean, you know, how many of us talked about supply chain three years ago? You know, a few of us, we were, you yeah, know, the maybe. total geeks, we were watching futures on, you know, I was watching futures on concrete and steel and things, but there are very, very few in regards to the architecture side. You know, we never had a conversation about supply chain. Well, supply chain sits right in this world. So in essence, Dave, you know, the, this is our ecosystem. This is where we live. So 
the notion is, is that if I can't solve all of these people's problems or be able to mitigate the issues that each of them have, you know, the, you know, the idea is that when I'm picking a modular provider, I need to be able to define, well, what is their capability? What is their capitalization basis? You know, are they debt free? Do are they, are they being restructured? You know, because I'm not going to be the one answering that, but there, there are people and the bottom one on the financing insurance, especially on the issue of due diligence. If you've ever not gone through a due diligence basis with a equity provider or a debt provider, it is truly a religious experience because they will ask everything about anything. And they are demanding of being able to say, well, What's your provider? What's his, you know, what's his background? How is he financed? How is he basically capitalized? What has he done over the last five or 10 years? And the problem is that when we start talking about that, you start getting into manufacturers that have a very short sort of a fuse that they've been in existence is that I, those are items that we cannot answer. And so then you have to find ways of how do we mitigate this? What is the best way of describing this? Um, in the projects that I was running that were modular, we actually got to the place where we were selecting MEP groups that have done dozens and dozens of modular projects because it was a way to mitigate not so much the project because we knew they were a work, they were great consultants, but more they were going to satisfy the issues of the finance and all the questions on due diligence. Um, you know, the same things with bonding capacity. So each of these are items that need to be answered, but there's no one truly answering right now. They're all kind of siloed. So walk, walk me through each one of these and, and how that's going to, how that, like, how do we address them? How is essentially work addressing them? And, and, and then where do we, where, where does it, where does the foothold come in to, for this to really start getting out to the masses? Gladly. So we'll just start, for, we'll kind of work our way around the circle and then we'll try to yeah. do it very quickly. So, I mean, the modular provider, it really is coming down to what's their capability? What is their spec level? Uh, each of the manufacturers are very different. And I've been to pretty much every modular manufacturer other than our dear friends up in Canloops, uh, NRB. Uh, I pretty much have been to every manufacturer west of Mississippi uh, multiple times. So each of them are structured differently. They have a different technical staff. They have a different capabilities on both their QA and QC. They have different capabilities in regards to how they interface the design process. So it's really understanding what is the best one that meets my client? What is their queue? What is their, where do I fit within their queue basis in regards to being able to uh, accept the dance where that's what is their deposit capabilities? A lot of the things that we start dancing with is bonding capacity. Uh, they bond. Can they not bond? Um, as I move further down, the authority having jurisdiction, I mean, in essence, here in the state of California, we work with the state of California and we work with the various localized AHJs. What I've actually done, a lot of my entitlement projects and the projects I was running as a developer, and now what I'm planning to do, what we do all the time here in Assemblage Works, is we integrate all of our reports with modular built into them. So our noise analysis is built with the idea that we are utilizing uh, uh, a, a much less noisy and much quicker manufacturing. And it's actually written into that noise analysis. It's shown the fact that we're shortening the, right. uh, we're showing the fact that we're reducing the amount of labor. It's getting the HJs then, especially the planning staff at first to understand, well, how does that affect my requirements under CEQA? How does that basically make a much better product and for the community at large? How do I describe this to the various neighborhood community uh, councils and things like that? And being able to, the next thing is actually assessing, well, what's their capability? What's their understanding of this type of product? What's their experience? How is this going to slow me down? Or is there ways I can mitigate that experience basis and show them the methodology, how we work through to accelerate our basis, both on the entitlement process, but also on the um, documentation and plan check review. But also on the other thing is really important is starting extraordinarily early with the permitting and the um, uh, sort of the uh, plan check and the people who are out in the field and making sure they understand where their scope begins and where their scope ends. Because there are still a lot, some HJs that are still not familiar with the idea that there are the staple implemented objects, i.e. the units, are not in their scope. And we have to be 
quite mindful of trying to get them early to make them understand that this is not in their scope. This is not in their purview. This is how they interface. This is where you look. This is where you don't look. So, you know, the AHJs are extraordinarily important because I have to ha hit them both, both on the early basis, on the planning development basis and working issues on height and things like that, all the way through plan check and actually through inspections. Financing, very similar to that, is really understanding their risk tolerances and their basis of understanding that, yes, I am going to have a product that is not going to be an asset that is going to be landing in a holding area and then it's going to be transferred to a place where it is an asset. And we've actually worked with a lot of different groups that are creating what I'll call mezzanine bridge financing to take some of that, I would say, fear-based lending practices away so that in essence, we either the GC or another entity is in essence creating a mezzanine form of financing to bridge the, the gap financing to get you in terms of your deposits and everything else. So um, builder's risk is now becoming a very big issue in regards to writing what I would call uh, water mitigation programs, because a lot of our things that we have hit over the last year or two in terms of large claims had to do with the fact that there was not a true process built in place at the very beginning of the project on how I was going to mitigate water and water intrusion into my project as I set them. And again, it's it's a nascent problem because we're sort of dancing in new territory, sort of. But it really is a way that if we attack it early enough, it's already there. It's a box that's checked off. It's an item that we discuss all the way through the process in terms of through design through bidding and then ultimately through construction that we have, we know we have it solved. Um, completion guarantees are coming a little bit interesting right now, but I think those are things that can be solved. And then it's really the issues of due diligence and getting them to be familiar and comfortable with the process. And again, that's a, a place where we exist to try to true teach, educate and guide. Um, supply chain is really becoming another major issue because it's not only the issue of, of whether they can supply, but if they can supply, how aggressive can we manipulate the supply chain to actually do other things that are beneficial to the project, i.e., you know, there are now manufacturers where I can actually go and say, look, can you supply me all of the light fixtures in the corridors and all of the inside work areas as a container that is that I can buy in the same tranche that I'm doing the rest of the modules because A, they right now, the manufacturers, and, and I would say within the next 10 years, the manufacturer is going to have more buying power than the subs because the subcontractors are starting to understand that their, their, their scope basis is being compressed and they are going to be more on the basis of speed and value than to materiality um, uh, differential and cost. And so where I'm going to get more of my attacking the supply chain and trying to control costs is not through the sub base, but actually manufacturers. So we've worked on now really starting to talk with as many of the manufacturers about going, can you do X? Can you do Y? Can you supply this? You know, even to the place where we're going, can you get me switch gear? I Because I'm here at, you know, switch gear now we're looking at, at least in, in, in California, it's a 14 month lead time for just getting switch gear on projects. So if I can accelerate yeah. that, I have built in a, and if I have a 10 month, if I built in a 10 month project because I've accelerated construction, but I have a 14 month of switch gear where I can't turn on the lights for four more months, it makes life a lot hard in terms of both right, me right. trying to explain to my developer and also the rest of the team. So it behooves us to be able to attack the supply chain. So. It gets into the idea of material availability, of being able to manipulate the spec basis to most best meet the basis of the project. What is on-site versus off-site that can utilize? And then what is the capitalization of this? Um, you know, and then the last two are really, in essence, integrally tied is the understanding of the associated consultants, MEP, uh, you know, from everything from MEP to uh, envelope to uh, EBM, exterior building maintenance, i.e. our roof access and everything else. And how we tie these two together so they're locked at the hip and they're actually talking to each other because right. really where we see a lot of the issues is the lack of uh, integration between, in, in essence, these two on the left-hand side. So 
What Assemblage Works does is that we, because of the experience we have, um, uh, right now we're a group of five. Many of us have been developers. Um, some of us are not developers, but they are highly experienced designers, is that what we try to do in every project is look how we can take this circle and be able to attack it from the very beginning of initiation of projects so that we, there's no surprise. We're not sitting around for five months going, well, how am I gonna get builders risk? Or how am I gonna basically do with my supply chain? Oh, or I, you know, that guy doesn't have a queue for another five months. I'm gonna have to go to X and I don't know anything about that manufacturer. So a lot of our things is yeah, really yeah. truly trying to be educated and try to educate our clients and our team on the on the methodology of how we would attack this uh, paradigm. You know, my, I mean, there is so much good stuff that being unpacked right now with everything that you're saying. Uh, we have about 10 minutes left. We have a bunch of comments and questions. So why don't we go to the audience sure. and uh, let's see how much time we have after that. We may have we may have to do a round two on this one. There's there's I'd a whole lot. more. To, there's, there's a whole lot more to get through here. So let, let's go in there and see uh, who, who's joining us today. And we'll give a couple of shout outs. So we have a LinkedIn user. I think that was Dong Lang, Dana Lang, Dana Long. So Dana Long, for whatever reason, her name doesn't pop up there, but it pops up on LinkedIn. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We also have Michael Betancourt from Humboldt County, California. Good to see you, Michael. Thank you for joining. We got Michael Bruce in the Gulf Shores. What's happening, Michael? One of the best laser scanners out there. That guy knows it all when it comes to the laser world. All right, moving on down to here. Hello from Shenzhen, China. Who's from? That's Derek Coburn. What's up, cool. Derek? Good, good for you to join us from China. Thank you. Uh, always a pleasure seeing you. We got uh, Rochelle Hill, Mount Vernon, Washington, also uh, joining us today. So that's exciting. Gregory from Chicago, the Windy City. I bet it's cold up there. Buzz, Buzz Howitzer says, let's build. Um, I don't know yeah. how to say that name. Maybe, maybe in your worldly travels, you can do it from YouTube says hello. So we appreciate, maybe if you, if you write your name in English, I'll be able to pronounce it, but I can't, I don't know. I'm not even going to attempt it. You'll just be mad at me. Just be mad at me. All right. We have another link. Uh, so I think this is, is this Derek? Let me look here real quick and see who wrote <laughs> that. That is Derek Coburn. Uh, did you work on the forest city projects in Ohio around 2014, 2016? No, I actually worked a little bit later. I actually worked on Stapleton and the uh, down Rancho Cucamonga, uh, okay. which were large, uh, basically large. I mean, Stapleton is a massive project. It's both a residential and a commercial project. Okay. Um, I also basically was, uh, uh, again, it was kind of an interesting position. I acted as a liaison between both the residential and the commercial division because they were trying to integrate housing into their large scale uh, mixed use uh, entertainment projects all over the United States. And one of my jobs was to try to figure out what that looks like. How do we integrate housing into malls? And uh, it was uh, it was actually a pretty amazing group to actually work for. I, I, it was one of my favorite uh, development groups I've ever, I, I had a fantastic mentor there and uh, it was one of my best experiences I've ever had. Love it. Love it. Thank you for that question. All right. We've got Henry Mickelberg. Nice to see someone who is highlighting the U.S. offsite line of credit hassles. Five decent sized projects and you're done for even with two hundred and fifty million dollars. Then he had a follow up comment. Totally relate to this. Before you know it, you're in bed with someone who just happens to have a rich daddy or a parent company. <laughs> got to love Henry. Never short on words. All right. We got we got Rochelle Hill. Let's talk about the duplication of information from design to manufacturing. Gatera, a full integrated company, had huge challenges with silos in design. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, Gatera. Oh, my God. That's a whole show just in itself. Um, I think Gatera started out with one of, I think, the most passionate and thoughtful ideas of how to integrate this industry. Unfortunately, it morphed from a design concept to an IPO uh, uh, basis, frankly. Um, I think the, there's, there's a whole issue in regards to the notion of utilization of, of information is that I would um, say that there's a good percentage, I would say 60 or 70% of the architectural field are using um, Revit as uh, almost like a Ferrari driving in second gear. Um, it's more based on notions of family and less based on the issue of, of implementation of information utilizing either Kobe or other data implementations. Um, 
I see the fact that where, where this is heading and what's actually with, and again, it's a different vector than it's, and it's this pointy stick moving us toward this is that the ESG world in regards to the need for data to in essence prove out capitalization and implementation of placing capital in the projects are going to drive us to start having to use these tools in a much more advanced, much more intelligent manner. Um, because the idea is, is that I actually had a call with uh, uh, one of the largest groups uh, in the world uh, that is doing ESG. And I, I, I shouldn't name them, so I'm just going to leave it there. But their whole point was we don't know what we want for data. We know we have to have data. And, I, and that was one of my questions. Well, what do you need? You know, because we can act and access all kinds of different things. But, you know, it's like, we can write in the families what databases in, in terms of embodied carbon and in terms of uh, sustainability and, and all these other things, what we need to know. And I think this dance is really going to be the next 10 years of right? It's really, you know, I right. would actually right. call it, it's modular or DFMA 2.0. Modular or DFMA 2.0. You heard it here, everybody. All right, here's, uh, we got two more comments and questions. How does assembly work? Break down the silos between designers, GCs, and owners. And we got about four minutes left. Okay, very quickly. Uh, one, we basically, all of our projects are oriented with the idea that we do design build or we do an IPD basis. Uh, we are willing to actually assemble, uh, take a long, a long risk, unlike a lot of architectural firms. The other thing is, is that we, because of our development experience and the nature of what we've done in the past, we very much try to integrate at the very beginning and create a pathway and a set of processes to walk our owners through how we wish to work, how we want to work, what does success look like, what does the performa and their business plan look like to our success. And it, it's a very different methodology than just, hey, let's go draw something. You know, here is a yield study and, uh, you know, let's take it to the next step. Uh, we're much more into the idea of asking very, very hard questions at the very beginning of, of what success looks like how we utilize module or DFMA to our success. What is it to your benefit? And then we create, a, in essence, a series of stair-step access points to how we yeah. progress the project. Absolutely, absolutely. So Henry, Henry Mickelberg does say, massive state of the industry, insightful brain dump needs around 2DC. And we're going to do that. And this is the last question we're going to take from uh, Peter Molinar. And Peter says, are these dwellings built to be airtight, well-insulated, properly ventilated, quiet, and comfortable? Yes, we're looking at multiple passive house projects. Um, we, again, uh, I believe that your ESG pointy stick in terms of your debt and financing is coming and driving us to this place. Yeah. Michael, we got a lot more to unpack. We're going to, as soon as we uh, end this show, we're going to schedule you to come back on for round two of this. Um, there's a lot of comments out there saying we need a round two. And I agree with everybody. We're pushing our uh, 50 minute mark. So is there anything that is very pertinent that you want to say before we close out this show that you think people should know? And then we can get into some of the other stuff on round two. Yes, I know you have something I, I, to say. Yeah. <laughs> Um, DFMA is where we all need to be. We, we need to stop futzing around and try and pretend that this is a, a nice to have. This is yeah. something that we need. And that's why we did what we did. We decided one quickly to state that we are a fully DFMA company because we have to be. It's the only way that we are going to solve pretty much most of the problems that are facing within our industry. And it's frankly the only way that we can make our owners successful. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, Michael, this has been absolutely awesome. I know we didn't get through every little piece and bit on here, but I think it's great because there was so much information that people could unpack. Here we go. See, look at it. Round two. Here it comes. Marty Tocosin. I don't know if you saw Greg Ugaldi joined as well today, head of the uh, National Association of Home Builders. He was the mm -hmm. past chair. So thank you for that. Uh, Lawrence need more kiss. OK, let's bring it on. Yep. Whatever. Um, Keep it simple, stupid. Yes, I, I know. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Go ahead. Totally agree. Yeah, but you know, it's you know, there's a degree of yeah, we can keep it simple, but the notion is is that our, our industry is so complex that you know we're gonna have to face right. the idea that yeah, I can keep it simple, but the notion is that usually is where you get run over on the backside by something else. I love it. So if you keep it simple, you can get run over by the backside on something else. Is that what you just said? Yep. 
<laughs> excellent. All right, Gregory says, excellent. All right, listen, everybody, that's a wrap for today. You have to join us this Friday with Mark Baranek and Willie. We will be live at one o'clock. And then again, Coffee with Dave. We're getting better and better at it. We're going to give you all the recaps. You might even hear a little bit about what Michael had to say this Saturday morning uh, when you sit down. So get some cliff notes ready, drink your coffee, and we'll have a good time. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an thank absolute you. honor and a pleasure. You got so much up in your brain. We're, we're going to have to unpack. We might even be up on a round three. Who knows? Well, I would love to. So thank you so much. I truly appreciate yeah. it. You're, you're very welcome. All right, everybody. I am in New York City, but I will be back in Pittsburgh on Friday to do the show in the studio. So until then, everybody have a wonderful hump day. Have a great rest of your week. And let's build it better because without people like Michael and others out there truly trying to drive change, we're not going to get there. So hit that like and share button, spread the word, and let's do it together. I'm Dave Cooper. Michael, don't go anywhere. I'll come back to you after the end of the show. Everybody else, we'll see you later. Bye now.